Hello to all viewers. Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. How are you doing? I'm very well, and you? I'm glad you're feeling well yeah, under so lockdown and you're still feeling well. Still in interesting days, so looking forward to what's happening next. Some people might be uh, negative about everything, but aren't we excited about everything that's happening? Yes, it has its positive aspects. Yeah. Will you open up for us with a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, as we discuss issues involving your truth, especially the truth for this time, I pray that you will be with our deliberations and guide our thoughts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. On the previous episode, we mentioned that we were going to discuss the spirit of prophecy in more broader terms. But before we get to that, we've received some interesting videos for, among others, Dr. Shiva, Dr. Bhutta, and then there's been some questions about Q, the QAnons. I don't know if you know anything about these. Yes, yes, we've looked at them. So what can you tell us that's interesting about these things that you find? Whew, <laughs> you're putting me on the spot here. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sure the viewers would like to know, yeah. for instance, what have you heard of Q? What have you heard about this announce? What do you think about these videos that surfaces about the swamp that will be drained and the Illuminati that will be exposed, Dr. Fawcy? That's and, and the New World Order, which will be prevented. Yes. And, uh, all of those issues. Well, before we get there, let me first uh, talk a little bit about Hegelian dialectic. Uh, Basically, what the, what the principle is, is that you put opposites into the world and then you rub the opposites up against each other until you finally get what is called a synthesis. Yes. Now, it's interesting that uh, if you study the workings of the Jesuits, for example, uh, in, in their oath, and uh, as it is recorded in the congressional records, yes. They state quite clearly what their aim is. It's the destruction of Protestantism. That is the aim of the Jesuits. And we mustn't lose that aim out of our sight. Yes. Now, what Protestantism are they interested in destroying in the time that we are living in? Any Protestantism that doesn't recognize the supremacy of the Pope, because that is another one of their stated aims, to restore the supremacy of the papacy. And then they state quite clearly that it is the duty of the Jesuits to climb in the hierarchies into positions of power and where they can uh, act as, as instigators of the particular directions in government that they want to have. And that's what uh, organizations like the Knights of Columbus, etc., are all about. Yes. That's, that's why they exist. That's their stated aim. Uh, that's why uh, William Barr, when he was asked about his affiliation to the Knights of Columbus, as we have already stated, uh, said, uh, no, it won't interfere with his work because he will render unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar. But as we said, there's only one Caesar in the world today who bears the title of Caesar, which is Pontifex Maximus. Therefore, he must be Caesar if he has the title of Caesar, yes. and that's the Pope. So when he answered, uh, I will render unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar, he wasn't breaking his oath in any way that he made to the Knights of Columbus, right? And the Jesuits do the same. They categorically state in their oath of allegiance that they will defend opposite sides of an issue, even acrimoniously. Yes. They will seem to be at odds with each other, fighting each other like like cats and dogs, so that in the synthesis that comes in the end, Mother Church will be glorified. Yes. So that's the aim. Even up to the point of death. Even to the point of death, yes. correct. That, that is their stated aim. Now, that's why I'm always fascinated when I see the role players. And I see that we spoke last time about Fawcy, for example, and in those videos that you mentioned, they really hammer Bill Gates yeah. and yes. uh, Fawcy, right? Mm. 
and say that these people are in cahoots and they have one idea and that is to inoculate the whole world and to give them the mark of the beast. And you know how the Christian world out there feels about the mark of the beast and they're all convinced that this is a microchip that will be placed into your, into your skin, etc., etc. So this is what their great fear is. And uh, what if you have a savior now? One who will arise and will save you from this terrible swamp, this deep state conspiracy to make everybody uh, a robot so that you cannot think for yourselves. And I mean, there are videos about... Uh, Funvax. Uh, Funvax, yes. The vaccination for the fundamentalist that uh, interferes with a gene that helps you to make your frontal lobe decisions on a religious basis, etc., and to make everybody uh, what they call normal. So we've seen all of those. Now, are we going to run with all of these? Uh, God wants people to make a decision based on rationality. Yes. Uh, emotional decision is, is like the wind. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Mm. You must have a rational basis. So I don't believe that God would permit humanity to be vexed out of its conscious decision-making capacity. God will not permit it. Because if people cannot make a choice, then they cannot be held accountable. Mm. And God wants to have people to be accountable. Yes. So what about if you look at this scenario, Forsey, as we saw, was Jesuit trained. Mm. The administration is Jesuit trained. Yes. They're both on the same, same uh, team, right? Yes. And the one is accusing the other one. And in those videos, they're saying that uh, the law has been broken, that th these viruses were manufactured, uh, and that it was an illegal action, that they have one aim, and that is, you know, to get all of humanity into their brainwashed system, etc., etc. And now you need a savior. Yes. And that savior is Q. And nobody knows who Q is. And some say Q is um, Donald Trump. Some say Q is uh, a Kennedy that has yes. died and not really died and will resurrect. And uh, all of those things are fascinating. And even if they were true, and even if it did happen, it wouldn't yes. change one iota because they're still playing both sides of the coin. The master plan is unchanged. The master plan is unchanged. So I would say don't get distracted by all of these things that are out there. Uh, it is his stated aim to always add truth to elements of falsehood. It is the most dangerous thing when you mix truth and error. It's like adding poison to a wonderful juice. <laughs> it is the poison that will kill you, yeah. even if it is in a wonderful juice. So if we look at it in terms of Hegelian dialectics, yes, so what? You have bad guys and you have good guys, so you're playing bad, go bad cop, good cop. And what if a savior appears who says, I will save you from all this? Will not the religious world rejoice? Yes. Will they not say, finally we're getting rid of all the evil in the world. Finally someone's standing up and arresting all of these child traffickers and the pedophiles and no matter where they are, whether they are in the Vatican or whether they're in the royal families or whether Hollywood it doesn't matter. Hollywood doesn't matter. We'll arrest them all. And then we'll clean up the world and we'll dedicate ourselves to what our constitution is after all that we are a people under God. Yes. Bring morality back. Morality back into the system and people, the church will say, hallelujah. And isn't Putin doing the same thing? Yes. Didn't he also bring God back into the constitution and say, we are a people under God? Mm. And isn't this a means to bring the world together and say, listen, we have really failed. We need to drain the swamp. Mm. We need to clean up the act. And then people will look to them as the saviors, the ones who are cleaning the act, no matter what name you attach to them. 
They brought peace to the world. Yes. And does the Bible talk about that? And whether it is a Trump or whether it is a Kennedy or whether it is a prince, whoever, Andrew, who cares? The bottom line is back to morality, back to the acknowledgement of God in the center. And then when you acknowledge God, then you also have to worship God. Yes. So why not dedicate a day to the worship of God? And what is the consensus out there? What day should that be? What are we seeing in the world? Yes. Sunday. So we've been saved from the mark of the beast, the implant, mm -hmm. only to be forced to keep the mark of the beast, which is a cognitive decision between the precepts of God and the precepts of man, a moral decision. Yes. So who will benefit in the end? Mother Church, yes. through this Hegelian dialectic. So I look at the role players and I'm not really interested who's bad-mouthing who and who is wicked and who has been drained from the swamp. But look at the former uh, CIA directors. Mm. They've all been removed because they were part of the swamp. They were yes. also Jesuit trained. Yes. They were all Jesuit trained. Now, isn't that amazing? So the Jesuits are removing the Jesuits. Does that make any sense? Yes. No, only in the light of the conflict between good and evil can we understand these things. And if we don't believe that there is a conflict between good and evil, we'll get lost in the maze. Yes. What if they should arrest the Pope? On what basis? Well, there are, there are these rumors that uh, arrest warrants have already been issued, that he stepped down from his position, that he is in self-isolation, as it were. Uh, there are, among the Catholics, there are the conservative circles which claim that uh, he's an anti-pope. And that the real pope is really in the wings. He's still there, he's not gone. Uh, Benedict, yes. and uh, books have been written, even uh, you know, amongst the people that, that believe present truth, stating that uh, uh, that is the one that will rise because it's the one that is and the one that is not and will come back, etc., that it'll be Benedict. You know what? I hope they're right. Because these people are so old, it would mean that the end is right here. Yes. <laughs> so it wouldn't really change anything. Yeah, yeah. But the fact of the matter is, we cannot think in terms of those futuristic ideas. And haven't we seen that uh, high-placed Catholic officials, cardinals, have been arrested? Yes. Some have been exonerated now, as in the case in Australia. Yes and people are up in arms, why should they get away with it, and this and that. Yes, we might see a few of these arrests of high-profile people and a cleaning up of the act and going back to moral standards. I find it interesting that post-corona, mm -hmm. the governments are saying we have a new economy coming. All the, all the governments are saying this, even here, our own government. Even our own government. A new economy, a new era, it's, everything is new. A new relationship between governments, a new, everything's new. It sounds like a new world order without a new world order, right? <laughs> so whether the one party wins or the other party wins in the so-called battle between the deep state and, and the others, it's actually irrelevant. There will be a new order. It might not look like they thought it would look, but it will be a new order. Yes. And it will not, as they all say, be business as usual. usual. And they're all talking about a six-day work week to make up for the losses, etc., etc. So, again, we're heading for the same thing. So, your question. Sab the Sunday law, according to the Adventists, you just mentioned a six-day work week. Yes. Be just explain a little bit more about that. Is the law only going to be that you, can't, you must worship on Sunday? 
I would have no problem with a law like that. Constantine made a, Constantine made a law mm. which says that you must keep Sunday holy and you may not work on a Sunday. That's the Sunday law. He actually had a few exceptions yes. uh, in that law, but you had to keep Sunday. But the Roman Catholic Church didn't have Constantine's law. The Roman Catholic Church stated categorically Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on the, Sabbath. Uh, the Saturday. Yeah. They shall work on that day. That was the law. So the anti-Sabbath law of the Roman Catholic Church actually enforces working six days yes. and resting on the Sunday. That is the law that I am waiting for. Uh, let's just go back in history a little bit, not so far back, when, they, when there was this great bailout, when the governments bailed out the banking systems and the nations had gone bankrupt and they had to be bailed yes. out. And in Europe there was major consternation and Greece was in a turmoil and Italy and uh, all these countries were experiencing great financial turmoil. Yes. Then the European bank spent huge amounts of money to bail out these economies and the banking system. Uh, one of the laws that was made was that there should be a six-day work week. Uh, and if a government didn't comply with those laws, they would fall foul of the agreement of the central banks that loaned the money. And uh, I find it interesting that the governments are now announcing, mm -hmm. like our own government yes. announced, that uh, they were receiving money from the IMF and from you know, all of these major banking institutions. I cannot for one moment believe that those loans do not come with strings. Yes. And uh, who controls this, these banking systems? Uh, who owns the Bank of America? Is it not the Jesuits that mm. control these things? And they say, you know, the Rothschilds. Mm. What does the word Rothschild mean? It means Rothschild. Yeah. And if you look up in the encyclopedia, the Jewish encyclopedia, it will tell you that it is Vatican bankers. Yes. So these are front Jews for the Vatican system. So it is Rome that controls the, the systems of the world, yes. And uh, so that, that's exactly what will happen with this. I, I believe a 60, six day work week will be the answer to the crisis. And it will come country after country until eventually through the leading of the United States, every country will adopt it. Yes, and um, the South African government sent out a document on education and one of the scenarios on when the pandemic has subsided and they can go back to school is that to catch up the lost days then uh, pupils might be forced to go to school on the Saturday. So now, the same uh, suggestion has now been made in Germany as well. So this is something that is happening. It starts small mm -hmm and then it grows. We mentioned the small time of trouble. This is not once, it gradually comes in. It gradually sneaks in and before you know it, it's there. Yes. Okay, so and the Pope, is it possible that he could be arrested? Well, as they say, there's an arrest warrant out for him. I have to see things like that before I believe them because there are so many winds of, of uh, stories and doctrines <laughs> blowing out there that if you had to believe every single one of them, you'd probably go crazy. But as I said, the conservative Catholics consider him an anti-pope and that the real one will eventually come out of the woodwork or another one will be elected in his place or whatever the scenario. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He will still be the moral uh, force in the world. If they arrest this one, there will be a next one. Yes, and how much better, if you want to think in their terms, if you have now this cleaned up system, the swamp is drained, the church has been purified of all of those liberals, 
and now we're getting back to serious morality. Well, then she still comes out shining like a rose. Yes. We can bring in the spirit of prophecy here. Because the spirit of prophecy has quite a lot to say about the Pope and all these um, things that are happening. Would you care to give us an introduction on what this second leg of Adventism consists of? Yes, this is of course <laughs> a very hot potato, uh, the spirit of prophecy. Uh, we did do a series, I did a series mm, a little while back with Francois Duplessis. Yes on the lesser light and the greater light, where we discussed it in great detail. Mm. So perhaps you can put a link in there and say, look at this. I will do so and, for further uh, study. I've also given some lectures in the past on this issue. Correct. Uh, God's guiding gift. There's a lecture with all the Bible verses and everything associated with it and the events that took place. If you put that link in there, then yeah, people can so. get the, the details. Yes, we don't have to repeat them in this forum. But uh, the question is, why does Adventism claim that it has this additional uh, prophetic backing in terms of the writings of Ellen G. White? Now, do we need something like inspired writings for the times we are living in? Do we not need them? Well, you know, if you look at a couple of Bible verses in this connection, uh, if you go to the book of Ephesians, for example, or 1 Corinthians, let me just go to 1 Corinthians. Okay, 1 Corinthians, and we'll look there at chapter 1. And it tells you about the spiritual gifts. And we read there from verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. You see, there's the testimony of Christ. So that you become, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the testimony of Christ must be confirmed so that you come behind in no gift as you wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this issue of spiritual gifts and in Ephesians we don't have to go there. It tells you what these gifts are. There's the gift of of preaching, there's the gift of healing, there's the gift of tongues, there's the gift of prophecy, there are all of these issues. Now, so if you go to Revelation chapter 17, then we read there, and this is a well-known verse, that the remnant that comes out of the great conflict between Christ and Satan, and uh, a church is always described as a woman, uh, I have likened you unto a woman, a comely woman, the church. You're a bride. You're a bride, Christ, correct. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Uh, it tells you that this, this city, this enemy city will reign over the over the earth. So that's the one side. And if you go to chapter 12 and you read verse 17, mm. then you see that the dragon is wroth with the woman. And this is now God's people uh, compared with a woman. So you have a Babylon compared to a woman. That's a church system. And then you have God's people, the remnant yes. compared to a woman. And when to make war with the remnant of her seed, so there will be this clash between the two systems. And it tells you the attributes which keep the commandments of God yes. as opposed to the commandments of men and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So now Paul said that you become behind in no gift as you wait for the coming of the Lord. Now if you go to Revelation chapter 19 and you read there in verse 10, the angel uh, that is talking to John in, in this revelation. And John is so overwhelmed that he falls at the angel's feet and the angel says, 
that he shouldn't do it. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, See that thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Yes. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. prophecy. So one of the attributes of God's people at the end is that the spirit of prophecy that Timothy had and that Paul had, Paul had. and that the prophets had will be repeated at the end of time. Now, it's always fascinating to me that uh, in the time period when the three angels' messages went into the world, as the prophetic time period of Daniel chapter 9, the 2,300-day prophecy came to an end, which was 1844, there arose a number of people that were prophesying. Uh, it was Joseph Smith of the Mormons, Ellen White of uh, the Adventists, uh, the Shakers. They were all in, in this prophetic mm -hmm. mode. And the question is, how do you distinguish which is true and which is false? Because the Bible clearly says that the remnant will have this gift and that those who wait for the coming of the Lord will not come behind in any of the gifts. So, how do you determine whether someone is a prophet or someone is not a prophet? Well, you study the attributes of the prophet. And the Bible tells you clearly that you should test the prophets. Yes. For example, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's just go there. In Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll look at verse 19. It says there, this is interesting, Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from the appearance of evil. So in other words, the Bible tells you, you shouldn't despise prophesying, but you should test it. Yes. Now, how do you test it? Biblical criteria. Absolutely. And what are the biblical criteria? Well, there's external, but also the preaching. All right. So external. there are external factors, and then there are the issues that are raised. When a prophet speaks, it must be in harmony with the Bible. No prophet can contradict a previous prophecy. So whatever the prophet says must be in harmony with the word. So if the Bible says, for example, that you must keep the commandments of God, and somebody prophesies and says that the commandments of God have been done away with, well, then you have a choice to make. Yeah. <laughs> Which one are you going to believe? What the prophet says must come true. Uh, there are certain things like conditional prophecy. Yes like Jonah, Jonah who was preaching and it didn't come true because they fulfilled the conditions, right? right? They became yes. converted. So what the prophet preaches must come true. It must be in harmony with the word. The life of the prophet must be in harmony with God's principles. You cannot have one who is living a licentious life mm -hmm. and then pretends to be a prophet of God because uh, when there is sin in the camp, God doesn't speak, right? Now that you mention that a prof what the prophet says must come true, it was interesting to me that I've actually read a few of these prophets and some of them even acknowledge, they have a list of, the, of their prophecies that didn't come true. So they already disqualify themselves just by acknowledging that there were some of their prophets, uh, prophecies that didn't come true. Absolutely. So... How do you know that someone is a, is a prophet or not? So you have to follow these biblical criteria. And there are some physical criteria as well. Yes. Daniel describes exactly how a prophet goes uh, into vision, for example, what happens. And if you study Ellen G. White, 
uh, she was investigated not in some corner, but uh -huh. in front of thousands. Yes, by doctors. By doctors, and she Physicians. fulfilled every single one of these criteria. Now, one of the criteria which doesn't stand so directly in the Bible, but, but which is absolutely the case when you study the prophets, they were all hated. Mm -hmm. What happened to poor old Jeremiah? <laughs> they yes. stuck him in the cistern. <laughs> they put him in stocks. They tore up his, his, uh, his writings. They hated him. So one of the criteria, a prophet is, is never loved. No. They love the tombs of the prophets, but yes. they don't love what the prophet said, no. right? Not one. And uh, poor old Isaiah was sawn in half. Yeah. And so, what is the case with uh, Ellen G. White? There are two prophets which stand out in her time. Mm. Ellen G. White and Madame Blavatsky. Mm. Those two. Yes. And they are contemporaneous. And the one publishes in a journal which is called Lucifer. Lucifer, <laughs> yeah. that's Blavatsky. Yes. And the other one says, we have no creed except the, the Bible. Bible. Read your Bible as it stands. The one uplifts the Bible, the other one denigrates the Bible. And Blavatsky was in favor of the Alexandrian and Synetic, uh, Alexandrian text. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Blavatsky favored the ex Alexandrian text and she said that the modern versions and those who you know, wrote the manuscripts on which they are based, that uh, only a Kabbalist would be able to achieve this rewriting of the document so that the entire sense of what was written before has been changed. So I find that very interesting. Yeah, I, you know, when you study the enemy, then often you can discover the truth by contrast. So if you go to the web pages and uh, the great uh, leadership echelons in the world, take the United Nations, for example. Who's exalted there? Ellen G. White or Blavatsky? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Blavatsky. The entire theosophical Yes. Uh, movement with Alice A. Bailey and Blavatsky and all of them. Oh, and you have all of these temples as part of the United Nations movement and these earth movements and, and you know, it is absolutely horrendously occult. Yes. But they are the heroes of the world. Yes. And the prophet that speaks about the Bible and trusting the words in the Bible, and we have no creed other than the Bible, that prophet is maligned and hated. In my own case, I, I always tell the story about how I got to know the sp spirit of prophecy writings. Yes. I see you have a book there, what's it called? The History of Redemption. Ah, The History of Redemption. It's, it's a magnificent book with many of her, her books and writings in it, yes. all in one compilation. She is one of the, the most celebrated authors in the world. Yes. The woman, who, woman author who wrote more than any other. Uh, she, she should be amongst the great authors of the world. She should have received every literary pr prize that the world could throw at someone of, of that nature. And she got not one of them. Yes. It's interesting that even some very prominent uh, media and radio broadcasters actually claimed that and they weren't Adventists but they'd read let's say the desire of ages must rank amongst the best books ever but how I got to know it is because a colleague phoned me and used very derogatory language about her to such an extent that I thought oh that's interesting why the animosity yeah so I started reading and I've never looked back. If you want to know whether this woman was inspired, do yourself a favor. Yes. Go read The Desire of Ages. Ages yes. Go read Steps to Christ. Go read uh, The Great Controversy. And based on what you read and not what you hear, make a decision. When you look at the web pages that are so horrendously negative, yes. 
then uh, if you base your decision on that, then you will have not done an empirical study. Is this, is this in harmony with God's word or is it not in harmony with God's word? Why would, why would a remnant church need a guiding gift like this? I mean, uh, take a church, I don't want to run churches down now, but mm. even though some of the things are so blatantly obvious that you just sit and say, whoa, and people still attend those churches? Mm. Take the Mormons, for example, mm. Joseph Smith. Through the gift of sin, man can achieve joy. I mean, <laughs> that sort of makes you yeah. stagger. Or their prophet, uh, Brigham Young, which said, the devil told the truth about Godhood. I would not have Mother Eve miss eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift, again, of sin. Yeah. <laughs> then you must know. Right? Man <laughs> can achieve joy. I mean, there's something blatantly wrong with that kind of statement, right? So, uh, yes, so you have that kind of prophecy on the one hand, and Everybody is quite happy. But when it comes to Ellen G. White, who yeah. uplifts Jesus, who uplifts the law of God, then all of a sudden she must be a false prophet, right? And there are, there are just thousands of statements of all her false prophes prophecies. Yes. And there are just as many books written against all of those statements. And you could you could study this ad infinitum. Fact of the matter is, if you take her writings and you read it, do they take you away from this Word of God mm. or do they take you towards to the Word of God? What's your experience, by the way? Well, it was when I came into Adventism, I barely knew about Ellen White. Well, nobody did, right? Uh, no. It's, it's, it's the best kept secret. Yeah. <laughs> and then eventually, the same happened, similar to what you had. And the people that were not happy that I've become Adventist were continually telling me that, no, this sect is just um, worshipping Ellen White and all her doctrines and all these things. And I said, I don't even know who Ellen White is. And they said, exactly. No, just May I interrupt you there? Yes. So, are you telling me that you didn't become an Adventist because of the writings of Ellen G. White? You became an Adventist because of the Word of God. Yes. Huh? I, can, I can vouch for that. I never knew her. No. Even when I was in the church already, I never knew anything about and her. And even when I, was, when I was in the church, you know how much animosity towards her was in the church. Aha. Uh -huh. and, and, and that surprised you? Yes, because now we new Adventists, we come in, we start, and I'm confronted with Ellen White. I start reading a bit and I said to wow, there's something here. Eventually, I really started reading. And then it dawned on me, this is impossible that she can be a false prophet in telling these. And as I began to communicate what I have been reading, people in the church started uh, distancing, distancing themselves. Okay. So that was, uh, and you mentioned in a in a sermon that you did that Revelation twelve seventeen that uh, you mentioned they have the testimony of Jesus. It's not just that they believe in the prophets. You said there that that word says they must own uh, that. It must be present in there or something like that. Can you just explain that, that sentence to me? Because that, made, that, that brought a lot yes, of light. Here are they me. that keep the commandments and have the testimony. Yeah. Now, if you have it, then it's part and parcel of you. Now, does the Adventist church and its fundamental beliefs claim that they believe in the spirit of prophecy as manifested in the writings of Ellen G. White? And the answer is yes. Now, where does the greatest opposition come from with regard to that? From inside or from outside? Yeah, from from inside. inside, correct. It's interesting that the mega preachers of the world 
And uh, you can mention them, any one of them. You, well, Come let's say Billy Graham or yeah. any one of them. That they have desire of ages on their shelves and that they study them. And some of their greatest sermons come out of this, but nobody knows that it was basically based on writings of Ellen G. White. Now, so why is it necessary for God to put something like that into the church? Why was it necessary that the early church had prophets? Why was it necessary that the church should, besides the word, also be guided by the spirit? Because every time when uh, there was a prophet, they had the word of God. Up until that Absolutely. Point. Now, when Paul preached to the Jews, did he preach to them what the Spirit told him, or did he preach from the Word of God? From the Word of he God. He preached from the Word of God. Where did Jesus send him after his uh, conversion? He sent him to the church. He sent him to the church. Now, this is, this is important. So, your conviction that you eventually preach is from the Word of God. But how did he get there? Mm. Because he was using that same Word of God yes. to persecute God's people in the beginning. What changed? His eyes opened. And through the spirit of prophecy, he started understanding what the Bible said about the Messiah, how he would come, that he would suffer, etc. So in this Babylonian confusion that we have at the end of time, where there are thousands of churches, each one teaching the weirdest things, yes. how do we get to the point where we get back to this word? And God in his mercy gave this church a simple, direct language that enlightens this book. So it is this book, the Bible, that is my creed. It is the Bible I base my faith on. But to understand it and to understand the nuances, for example, when it comes to the way the Bible is written, type and anti-type. Yes. I mean, when you read the Bible and a story is just a story, well, what impact does it have mm -hmm. if it's just a story? It's something that happened in the past. But what if it is a typology of a greater reality in the future? Now, I would never have discovered this beautiful aspect of typology if I hadn't read Patriarchs and Prophets. Yes. Suddenly, all the stories in the Old Testament come to life. Yes. And they're not dead stories about the past. They are stories which enlighten the present. And without it, I would not have been able to see it. And once you've been nudged in that direction, you start reading this book and the whole book comes to life. That's so true. Yeah. You know, once you read a book like Patriarchs and Prophets or even um, Great Controversy, if you keep your Bible next to you and every time she reads passages or refers to passages in the Bible, you go and read that passage, you will find that almost half, if not more, of your time you will spend in the, in the Bible. Exactly. She doesn't take you away from it, she leads you to it. Yes. So she is the lesser light pointing you to the greater light. And if it weren't for that, then we could be so confused in the end by all the winds of doctrine that you're listening to the winds. But what about the word? And that's one of the reasons why I, I love the spirit of prophecy. You know, I think the people out in the world are scared of prophets. Oh yeah, because there are so many false prophets. That's the problem. So whenever you hear somebody's got a prophet, oops, no, we must stay away. Because that verse that Jesus said, beware of false prophets, now everybody is a false prophet. Now, they, so we haven't had actually any true ones. But he says, test the spirits. Yes. Don't despise prophesying. So there must be a true prophet if you are not to despise it. And if there is a true one, then you have to use the biblical criteria to determine 
whether she is true or whether she is not. Now, I've been involved in, in uh, preaching this word for well over 30 years, right? Mm. And uh, don't you think that every single negative that is in any way even remotely possible has been thrown at my head? Mm. And have some of them sort of stunned me? Yes. Of course. Of now course. I can be an ostrich and I can put my, my head in the sand and I can say, uh, whoa, this must be a false prophet. Mm -hmm. But every single one that I've, that I've studied, because I don't want to be deceived. No. Every single one of them, she has come out as the true light and the accusation as totally false. Yes. Often based on complete misunderstanding mm -hmm. of even the, the basic plan of salvation in the sanctuary message, for example, either that or a quote out of context. Yes, that's, uh, that happens a lot. Don't they do that with the Bible? Too? Exactly. It's interesting. If you have to study inspired documents, or like the Bible, how do you study them? You've got a certain criteria. Yes. And that applies to the spirit of prophecy as well. Yes. Don't take things out of context. The hermeneutics play a big role. And especially the historical grammatical interpretation. And people that look at the Bible, such as higher critics, they come and look at a verse and they say, and, and maybe if there's something that looks like it's contradictory, they'll say, oh, but this is not true. What's the answer? Whereas if you are a Bible believer, really, and you want to see what the word says, you say, why don't I understand what's said here? Yes. There must be something else. I must do deeper study. And with the spirit of prophecy, Ellen G. White's writings, you've got the same. People will take a quote and then this is what she said, so she must be a false prophet. You must have this, put the same principle to the test. Why? Don't I understand this? And then go and do further study. Correct. So you can read contrasting statements in the Bible and say that the Bible contradicts itself. I think somebody once sent me a document with about 3,000 contradictions in, in the Bible. Yeah. And uh, when you read them, you say, whoa. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, you're know you very taken aback. And I actually did the trouble to go through those statements. I don't know to which number I got when I finally realized, you know what, these people don't understand very basic things in the Bible. Mm. Like, let's say, for example, uh, in one of the Gospels, you will have an event described and it'll say it was on this day, this time, etc., etc. And the next Gospel describes the exact same event with different times, different days then you say one of the two is wrong. Mm. And then you discard it. And they make big scenes about how the Bible has contradicted itself and that not even two Gospels are in harmony. And then when you do a little bit of a deeper study, you find out the one is using Roman reckoning and the other one is using Hebrew reckoning yes. and then the times differ. Yeah. Like Daniel was in his third year and Nebuchadnezzar was in his second year, but Nebuchadnezzar had him arrested. How can that be? So they must be wrong, right? One of them must be wrong, mm -hmm. one of the statements. But uh, in Babylonian reckoning, they had an ascension year and then they counted the years. So there's not a disharmony. And the same applies to Ellen G. White. They say she contradicts herself here and there, and if you study them, then you see they don't really understand yes. the issue. And uh, so many of these dis uh, just disappear when you, when you do a deeper study. For me personally, the deeper you study, and I've, I've mentioned now this hermeneutical way of studying and all this. I didn't study, I didn't study it like, uh, like that. I just read her books. As it stands. As it stands. Yes. And it is truly amazing what insights into the Bible I've gotten out of it. I've only been blessed by reading her writings. Well, I can only, I can only say that uh, I, I read the Bible and you have this confusion 
that develops in your mind between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Yes. If, you, if you read what Dawkins writes, mm. for example, uh, how he, he, he hates the God of the Old Testament and says the New Testament version in Jesus is, is no better because, <laughs> you know, one is sickly sentimental, the other one yeah. is, is, a, is a whatever, the most worst, the worst names that he can possibly think of. And once you start reading the spirit of prophecy, the character of God uh, becomes clear. Yes. And you see that there is really no disharmony between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Absolutely. There is perfect harmony. And you start understanding how God yes. works and how he thinks. And all of those so-called contradictions disappear in the mist. Definitely. Like mist before the sun. Now it becomes so much more clear and it, it's colorful once you read the spirit of prophecy. Yes, the Bible is quite clear. It tells you that we should believe in the prophets and we will be established. It's Amos that says it, I believe. And uh, this is exactly it. If you want to be established, God in his, in his wisdom gave this prophetic gift to the last church, to the remnant that keep the commandments. And if that gift is not there, then it cannot be the remnant because according to the criteria, it has to be there. Yes. So like it or hate it, it has to be there. Now, you can use the Bible as a ha like a hammer and you can use the writings of Ellen G. White like yes, a hammer. Exactly. Uh, depending on what you quote. You can use the Bible as the most soothing solve on your wounds. Yes. <laughs> you can use the writings of Ellen G. White like the most soothing salve on your wounds. And that's the nature of the Word of God. The, the Word of God will strike you and hurt you and then bind you up and heal you. Yes. And she will do the same. So the two spirits are in total harmony with each other. There is a rebuke and there is love and there is healing. And uh, I would not uh, want to be without it, especially in the times that we are living in. That's interesting that you mentioned it because I just want to also put this in. Once you've read The Desire of Ages and you've really met Jesus, then you can re go on and you see the other things like great controversy and we can clearly see where we are heading in this world. Absolutely. And it, it's, it's not frightening, it's actually uplifting to be seeing the things happening before our eyes, prophecy being fulfilled and knowing that Jesus is coming soon. What is it that the world says? Just, just look carefully at the world. When things go wrong on this planet, and they're constantly going wrong, yes. natural disasters, you name it, coronavirus, you can call it whatever you like. The, the question is always, where is God in all of this? Mm. Why doesn't he act? Is he impotent? Is he not doing anything? What's the problem with God? Whereas if you understand it in the light of the great controversy between good and evil, you know that God is absolutely in control complete control and it is so comforting to know that what you are seeing happening in the world is actually the fulfillment of prophecy. If it weren't so bad, yeah. you wouldn't be understanding the, the real issues. Yes. So it is comforting as you say. Definitely. And one last point that I would also just like to make is that it's going to be hard and I think I'll have to phrase this carefully, but it's going to be hard for anybody to stand in the coming days without the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. The fortification, the one supports the other. Yes. And if you have them both, then uh, you are more fortified. And of course, both of them require obedience. Yes.
to God's precepts. To God's precepts. And what are God's precepts? Uh, they are spelled out in the Bible and clearly spelled out in the spirit of prophecy. So if you apply them to your life, then the channels of your mind become clearer and you can understand the Spirit speaking to you through the Word of God. It always has to speak through the Word of God. If the Spirit of prophecy were not in harmony with the Word of God, I could never accept it. Me too. But I found it to be in harmony with the Word of God. And so I would encourage the viewers to study it. Uh, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. Take a book, like the great controversy. If you want to understand how you are saved, read chapter 7 in Steps to Christ. It is the most beautiful chapter. It is so Protestant, so evangelical. It is so beautiful that nobody can misunderstand what Paul is writing in the book of Romans or in any other of his epistles that are hard to understand. Once you've read a simple little chapter in the book Steps to Christ. Or if you want to know about Jesus, read The Desire of Ages. If you want to get to know the God of the Old Testament, read Patriarchs and Prophets. If you want to know what the issues are that are happening before our eyes now, read The Great Controversy. These are things which fortify the mind with good things. Don't read the Blavatskys of this world that, that glorify Lucifer. Read those that glorify Christ. Amen. Can I close off with, with a word of prayer? You certainly may. Oh, Heavenly Father, what a privilege to have you in our lives. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for showing us the way in your word. Help us to be good lights out there and to spread your word among other people. Bless everybody that have looked at this discussion and please send your Holy Spirit to protect us in the bedlam of noise that there is in the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.